Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for, for rejoining us and for, uh, for staying with us for a really important session. Just before we kick off, I'd just like to uh, say uh, a big thank you to um, the catering team here in the Convention Centre, headed up by Michael Fox, uh, for, uh, for looking after us so well over the lunchtime. So a big thanks to, uh, to everyone there. Um, great. Well, look, uh, really important session this afternoon. As I said, you know, we're, we're all aware of the real challenge there is around the, uh, the staffing and skills in the uh, in, in in our in our sector. So, you know, in terms of, I just we've, before I hand over uh, to Cayman and Jenny, they're going to take you through some of the research and some of the findings. I just, I suppose, wanted to say, you know, how important that that all of this is. We all know that this isn't just a problem for tourism. The, the, we are very much in a uh, in, a, in a market where it is, there's a lot more, um, get this right now, there's, there, there's a lot more jobs than there are people to do the jobs. Uh, this is very different from the last time we came out of a crisis, uh, following the financial crisis where there was a lot more job, there was a lot more people than, jo than, than jobs. It's the other way around this time. So really important uh, that, uh, that we are as good a sector to work in as, as possible, uh, and the businesses in our sector are as good as they can be. There's a couple of realities, I suppose, we've got to we've got to recognise where where we operate in. You know, first of all, we, we all we're all aware that the the profit margins that exist in tourism and hospitality businesses are not as high as the profit margins that exist in some other sectors. And that means that it is always going to be more difficult to match the kind of wage demands, et cetera, that can be made in other sectors. So that, that's, that's just the reality of, of the sector. Another reality of the sector is if you're running a tourism business, you need a lot of your staff in the business, on the ground, virtual and remote working. It's, for some of the team, that's OK. But for a lot of the team, you need them on site. And in, those, in the areas where people are more and more looking for that virtual and remote working, that, make, you know, that makes it even more challenging for tourism businesses uh, to attract staff in versus some other sectors. And the other factor about our sector is that, you know, in terms of we, we need to work longer hours, we need to work on social hours, nighttime, weekend, etc. It all needs to be covered. Um, which once, you get, once again, you know, is another challenge particular to this sector that other sectors don't have in, to the same way, and uh, that lots of other sectors don't have to the same way. So I suppose all of that means that if we want to get the people and the talent we need to work in our sectors, it means that being good employers is not enough. We need to be brilliant employers right across the sector, consistently brilliant employers right across the sector. You know, and all of the campaigns, all of the work, all of the recruitment, it won't last in the long term if, if we're not brilliant employers right across the sector. Uh, and there isn't, you know, in terms of, you know, the one thing I would say to anybody running any business now is that a key question that you've got to ask as a senior management team, and, and we ask it in Fulch, Ireland, and I think you know, everyone I talk to is asking this question, but how am I going to be a better employer this year than I was last year? How am I going to be a better employer this year than I was last year? And if we're not asking ourselves, as senior management in organizations, if we're not asking ourselves that question, we are going to lose talent because other people are asking that question and other people are get, becoming better employers. So, you know, that's, that's as we go through this afternoon session and we look at the, 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 the research and the supports that are there, one of the key questions I would say, please, please keep asking yourself that question and please keep thinking about that because that is going to be so important to making sure we've got that, that pipeline of talent. I'm going to hand over in a second now to Cayman Wall, who's going to take you through uh, the research, and then Jenny DeSalle is going to take you through the plans we've developed coming off that research. Um, so, uh, but just before I do, a lot of work has already gone on this space in, uh, in, in 2021, and we've just got a short little video uh, to show you some of the stuff uh, that was done last year uh, to help develop uh, careers in tourism. So we'll run the video, and then Cayman will come, up, come on afterwards. And I'll be rejoining for some questions and answers later in, in the session, so please keep feeding your questions through. Thank Thank you, we'll talk to you later. The last two years have been among the toughest on record for the Irish tourism industry. COVID-19 has had a devastating impact on staffing and skills. As the industry reopened in 2021, our focus was on supporting businesses in their recruitment drive. To help businesses compete for staff, 
We provide supports and expert guidance on how to recruit in challenging times and showcase the breadth and variety of careers across the sector. Using tourismcareers.ie, we highlighted the range, flexibility and opportunity that tourism offers. Vibrant social media campaigns and motivational content shone a spotlight on great employers who went above and beyond in making tourism a rewarding and appealing workplace. We worked together with our colleagues in third level education to promote the rich variety of courses available, optimizing the tourismcareers.ie website and delivering strategic digital marketing campaigns. The summer presented an opportunity to recruit students who were available for temporary work. Together we helped businesses to build and sustain relationships with local education providers to access talent pools of students and recent graduates. To help alleviate the pressure on businesses to upskill new staff, 2021 saw significant on-the-job upskilling opportunities with the launch of online professional development courses. In September, the Be The Pulse campaign launched to give tourism businesses a voice to amplify and broadcast their exciting vacancies. Recently, we completed an extensive body of research, the most comprehensive engagement with employers and employees to date, delivering insights which have been critical in shaping our plans for 2022. Together, we're looking forward to showing our resilience. As we emerge from the shadow of COVID-19, we will continue to support the industry to rebuild its talent and skills to drive recovery. This is one of the greatest challenges facing our industry and we are committed to tackling it together. Hello, my name is Cayman Wall. I'm Head of Economic and Inventory Analysis in Fall Ireland. I'm going to take you some slides now that goes into the body of research that we have. Paul did a good job of teeing up the, um, the context of this, so I'll do a few minutes just to make sure this is kind of firmly understood. Through our research, we've established that there are 40,000 vacancies out there in the industry. A quarter of those are at senior level. Recruitment is difficult. Retention is also a challenge for the industry, leading to a major skills gap out there. And there's also perception issues out there in terms of the feedback that workers are getting on the job and what they're saying to others looking to work in the industry. All of this is leading to a challenge and a crisis point for the industry unless it goes, excuse me, if it goes unresolved. Because this points to a supply side difficulty. Demand is returning. Supply is what's called into question. Just to say a little bit more about this, um, context and the body of work that we've done. As Paul has mentioned, this is the most comprehensive piece of analysis undertaken ever into the tourism and hospitality labour market. This work wasn't on our work programme this time last year. It's only as the industry came into um, the reopening phase at the end of Q2 last year that this emerged with the challenges getting people back off pop and into work. We've undertaken two surveys of the tourism businesses out there. We had our biggest uh, job survey ever on the job survey talking to workers and we did that in partnership with jobs.ie. We got our hands on 5,000 workers uh, to take part. We've also looked at the service provision that's out there, benchmarked internationally to see what we can learn from others and we've also engaged extensively with the recruitment industry to see what learnings arise from there as well. As I mentioned, this is something that came back, that came onto the radar, excuse me, as the industry looked to reopen. If you look at the PUP data, four in every 10 workers who were on PUP did not go back to their original employer. Some of them went back to a new employer within tourism and hospitality, but many workers left the industry altogether. That left us in a situation with last summer, one in three were brand new to the industry, having never worked in tourism and hospitality previously. As I mentioned, the count is 40,000 jobs unfilled and a quarter of those are at senior level. And that's specific to tourism and hospitality. If you look at the wider labour market out there, we're already back to peak employment in the Irish economy. The Irish economy is well on the way to recovering from the crisis in an overall sense. And unemployment is heading for 5% by the end of this year. The recruitment and retention difficulties are only going to get worse as the year goes on if the industry doesn't uh, look to resolve the situation. 
that's the bigger context of what's going on uh, within tourism. Um, I'll talk now about the industry's views and what we fed back from, what the industry's fed back to us. This is the first of the, of the, the main blocks of research to share. Of the almost 1,000 businesses that took part, we got a lot of responses on the difficult to fill position question. And this chart, and by the way, you're going to get a set of slides uh, emailed out to you, everybody who signed up to be here. So you get all these sl slides sent to you afterwards, so that I understand there's, there's a lot to take on board. But I'll just call out the, the main points. That chart there is showing the difficult to fill position. So for example, top of the chart there is chefs. 88% of employers said they were difficult to fill positions. All the others said th there were just some challenges in, in recruiting. And that's present throughout the industry. You're talking about in the kitchen, in the food service environment, uh, bars, bar service, accommodation servicing, and front of house, and at all the levels. There's a recruitment challenge. The problem is not quite as severe on the retention side, but it is definitely something that wasn't there pre-pandemic on that one. Recruitment was a problem previously. In terms of the reasons for these challenges, employers are calling out and recognizing a number of issues that are underlying what they're seeing. The unsocial hours was mentioned most frequently, as was competition from other employers, other employers in the industry, but also other employers more generally. Particularly retail, a lot of workers that didn't come back to the industry are now in the retail sector. A lot of businesses cited unrealistic wage expectations from the point of view of what they can afford to pay, given how the business is currently run. A major issue that was called out as well was a loss of international workers, most acute in Dublin and on the food servicing side. I'll come back to that one um, a few times actually before I'm finished. This is a key slide for me in terms of the impact on the business if these difficulties are not resolved. Over 80% are talking about added stress levels on those who work in the business, those who work on and run the business. A similar number, 80% are talking about the impact on the uh, customer experience, whether it's a reduced trading period, a reduced menu offering, a lower service offering than they would like to provide. So you're already seeing their supply being curtailed. Uh, stress levels, as I mentioned as well, but the key stat on that chart for me is actually towards the bottom there, where 30% are talking about closure, the risk of closure, if this issue is not resolved. Again, that's speaking to the industry's ability to supply at a a very base level, never mind what it supplies. We complemented the industry views with an on-the-job survey uh, through our partnership with jobs.ie, the Irish jobs platform. We got our hands on 5,000 uh, workers out there. Three and a half thousand of those have direct experience of working in tourism and hospitality. A huge depth of experience. Over half of those people, 54%, have had six years or more and another one third have one to five years in the industry, working right across the country and right across the sectors in there. It's a very strong sample size. And starting with the positives there, because there's an awful lot of positives in what we did find, the reasons to work really called out a passion for the sector. You're by and large dealing with people, people. They want to work on teams and interact and, and deal with customers. COVID has obviously impacted that between wearing masks and social distancing and so on. Um, a lot of people call out the opportunities uh, for career progression. You're seeing also statements like the flexible hours, the pay, the best prospects locally. To my mind, that calls out there's two kinds of workers in the industry. Some of them are in for the long haul, others are there because it suits where they live and the hours that they have available to work. And this chart reinforces another very positive message out there. If the conditions are right and people think that it's worth their while sticking around, over 70% want a long-term career in tourism and hospitality. There's actually hiring in for those who are slightly older, chefs and for males. But there's an awful lot of positive default settings amongst those who work in the industry. And please keep that in mind. This chart points to some of those feelings, by the way. 70% talk about enjoying the work environment. And again, these are people, people. They're working and interacting on teams, dealing with customers. But other aspects tend to be more mixed. Um, for example, 
the closure piece out there, that's definitely an issue. People's feeling of job security has definitely been impacted quite heavily in, in the last two years. There's also some things that are, that are readily addressable, like the, the low level of constructive feedback being given in the workplace is something that, that needs to be considered. People also call out pay as a source of dissatisfaction. I'll go into that a little bit as well as we go on. But a lot of positives to take forward. But there is a lot of um, sobering kind of findings in there too. And this chart deals on two issues around treatment and what those workers called out to us. The first one there is about long or unplanned hours. People are due a break, not getting the, a break because it just got busy, a, a bus dropped in unannounced, and now we have to keep on going. That's putting those workers under pressure and they're, they're feeling it. But as well as that, there's a, an expectation and sometimes a feeling that people are constantly on call. When they've gone off, they're about to go off. Um, they're going about their business at home, they have a day off, next thing the phone pings, can you come in? That is causing people stress, particularly those with busy lives, and those with busy lives whom they need to cater and plan around others. It could be children, for example. But there's also treatment issues being called out about how customers treat them, and also at times how management and their colleagues are treating them. And basically it's unprofessional treatment, a, a low levels of, um, of positive feedback, a complaint is made. Sometimes the staff can be feel like, made to feel like they're the meeting sandwich between a customer and management. Pay, as I mentioned, was also an issue. You see on this chart, over half the workers, or approximately half the workers, get paid between 10 and 12 euro an hour. And the pay rates are on the relatively lower end of the scale. That's traditionally been the way in the industry. That's not really kind of, um, a new finding to us. This just reinforces what we found out before. I suppose what, what is changing is um, unsocial hours. People are not well rewarded or frequently rewarded for working unsocial hours. Two thirds get some form of compensation for working a bank holiday, but thereafter it's, it's not a common feature of the industry. Other sectors out there are paying more than they have pre the pandemic, but they're also offering premiums and paying more for unsocial hours. So while the industry hasn't changed its habits, other sectors have, and those sectors are hungry for workers, and they're looking at the industry, our industry, for, for people, because they see people who work in tourism and hospitality having very attractive features. I mentioned the, the, the long-term commitment, passion for people, they, they're keen to work in teams. Others see those features and, and want them on their own, uh, on their own books. Um, this is a very important chart for my money from the workers' feedback out there. A very positive message from this chart is, sorry, I should, should clarify one thing. On this chart, we focused on those who have left a job in tourism and hospitality or are thinking of leaving a job. And we asked them, are you willing to reconsider? If so, what needs to change? Very reassuring there, almost nine in 10 are willing to reconsider if things change. And in terms of what needs to change from the, from the bottom of that chart upwards, simple, straightforward, operational things like clearly defined terms and conditions, a long-term contract, giving them more job security, um, a better work environment, more visibility of uh, career progression opportunities would make a huge difference. Almost half of people would reconsider their, their, their decision or their inclination to leave if something as straightforward as a predictable work schedule was made available on a regular basis. As you go up the chart there, you're getting into more expensive solutions around pay, perks, benefits, uh, and entitlements that you get in, in other sectors. But bear in mind the context is changing here as well with the, with the, with the uh, upcoming legislation changes around entitlements and certain benefits. But very, very positive. A lot of workers are very open to the industry and they're very willing to reconsider if changes are made. This isn't a, a, a new chart. I just put two pieces of information side by side here. And you see there side by side the views from the, what the workers have said sat opposite what the industry has said. There's a huge level of alignment, agreement and commonality out there in terms of what would make a difference. Visibility on career paths, um, progression opportunities, Unsocial hours needs to be resolved, but there's only so much that can, can be done on that given the nature of the industry. There's competition from other employers. That's bidding up terms and conditions and salaries. Employers and employees are very clear on that. Pay is also being called out. The workers um, understand and realize that they have more negotiating power than they did before. They're very clear that changes need to happen 
and their, their clear expectation is that it's the employers have to up their game and move on in, in that environment. We did a, another body of research to sit beside the industry work and the, the workers piece, looking at the external view. We benchmarked internationally and we found some interesting things. A, a key piece here is that of all the countries we looked at and even more widely, this issue is not unique to Ireland. Tourism and hospitality out there is facing a very similar set of challenges for a very similar set of reasons. They're calling out uh, unfilled roles, a lack of suitable candidates, difficulties in retaining upward wage pressure. And every single country we looked at mentioned a lack of international workers. They're just not being sent out from certain markets like they used to. A curious feature of what was out there, certainly on the European side, is there's a, there seems to be a reliance on public sector bodies to resolve the problem. And bear in mind, the workers are very clear that they see a lot of the solutions and the change that needs to happen happening on the employer side. So that points to me to a disconnect between the challenge and the solutions to that. Going on to the recruitment agents, a very interesting and very actually practical set of um, insights arise from what they told us, because we were able to speak to recruitment agents who specialise in tourism and hospitality, but we were also able to speak to those who work in other sectors and have an international presence. When you compare tourism and hospitality with other um, industries out there, what we're feeding back, what's being fed back to us, excuse me, is this confusion on this part of candidates about the, the roles that are being offered, the job specs, the, the, the level the role is at. Compared to other industries, how tourism presents its jobs to candidates is fuzzy and unclear. The career path was definitely mentioned as well. If you're in, say, um, a, a more structured environment like an accounting practice or a legal firm, once you hit certain landmarks, you know you're eligible for promotion, you're eligible for a pay rise. That level of clarity and um, the stepping stones that are out there are not as clear cut yet in tourism and hospitality as they need to be. They're certainly not as clear cut as they are in, in other sectors, and that's causing people to do a double take. There is clearly strong competition for international mobile workers. In Ireland, other industries are very keen to recruit, and they're taking workers from our industry, but tourism and hospitality internationally is just the same as us, as I mentioned. They're very, very keen in all of our competitor destinations to get their hands on the workers that we also want to get into this country and working for us. Some employers have unrealistic wage expectations. For example, you could see something like a, a job for a chef being advertised calling for a wide repertoire and then the salary and offer is pretty much minimum wage. Or you might be talking about a manager with international experience and a language or two, and then the salary and offer is not commensurate with those expectations. Where that's happening, the recruitment agents at this stage aren't even taking on those jobs. There isn't a fee in it for them. They're moving on. More positively, employers who are being creative with their roles are getting good results by building in predictability and visibility. The candidates can see what the job is going to be like. They can understand and plan their life around the job more easily. In some instances, and you've probably seen it yourselves, what's happening now is rather than a, a candidate being interviewed, they're nearly interviewing the business to see if I want to work here. Other employers are getting ahead of their game, presenting themselves well, and making it easy for candidates to understand what the job will be like and work for that employer. Uh, the salaries are being bid up, as I mentioned, as are the terms, conditions, and the perks. That arms race and that war is also happening on that front. A key message, the better organized employers, no matter what the industry is, get better recruitment results, and they also get much better retention results as well. The better organized you are from the start, the easier it is to get a result, and that comes across in the interview process as well. Uh, this is coming on to my last slide before I hand on to Jenny. But I'm just going to bring together in a couple of key messages all of the pieces here that you've heard such that um, there's no ambiguity as to what I've said and what it means. The issue is universal to all parts of the industry, all subsectors and all parts of Ireland. Not only is it universal to the industry here, it's the same in the competitor destinations. Secondly, doing nothing is not an option. Right now, it's a seller's market out there. The candidates, 
holes, the whip hand. As Paul mentioned, there are more jobs than there are people to fill the jobs. That's very different from the last time we, we, we came out of a, of a crisis in Ireland. Labour market mobility is unprecedented. With the stopping, starting and reopening of tourism, people have had a chance to reconsider. Some of them have taken that opportunity and they need convincing in some cases. Demand is certain to return. We know that from all the economic data out there and the booking patterns and the air access. A lot of savings are being, are being accumulated. People are willing to spend. What's called into question is the ability of the industry to recover and supply to meet that demand. Last message then as well as employers must do more to make the job attractive because this is an arms race. Others are out there, others are active and they're moving on. If the industry doesn't respond to that, they will get left behind. Thank you, I hand over to Jenny now. Thank you very much, uh, Cayman. So, what needs to happen now? As Cayman has outlined, the labour market is more competitive than ever and immediate changes need to be made to retain existing employees and to attract new employees. By committing to driving long-term change, we can build tourism back bigger and stronger and create a fundamental shift in employee perception that will support the long-term repositioning of the tourism industry and ensure a future pipeline of talent. And as we do this, we will also need to change the narrative to being about working in a great sector where you get to do what you love and are rewarded appropriately. We have seen many of you leading the way in this change in 2021. For example, offering flexibility on working hours matching shift patterns to the needs of the employee, whether they be working parents, retirees or students. And we've also seen great creativity in recruitment ads, showcasing the passion points of the job as opposed to the role itself. Love of the outdoors, environmental change and meeting people. To fill the vacant jobs out there, we need to bring new people into the sector. And to do this, we need to make potential employees see that tourism can offer a good job. So, from an employee perspective, what does a good job look like? The research has shown us that there are three key elements to a good job, but we must remember that this is just the starting point. The question for the employee is no longer, where can I get a job? But it's rather, what job do I want? And with the choice that is out there, they are asking, should I work in tourism and should I work in this business? So while this section does focus on what the employee has said they want to ensure sustainable jobs, this all needs to be done within the boundary of what the business can afford. So firstly, pay and working arrangements. Employees do need to feel that they are being paid what they are worth and that their employer values them. They are comparing packages to those that are available in other sectors such as retail and they do expect to be offered sim similar benefits. So for example, if they're working on social hours, they expect to be rewarded with either extra pay or time in lieu and to be offered sick pay, pension and medical insurance. Stable work patterns are also key. They do reduce employee stress levels and are a motivating factor when choosing a job. And while I know this will be challenging, we have already seen individual businesses starting to offer scheduled shift patterns to great effect. They're getting higher application uh, rates for their job offers and they are getting improved employee satisfaction. And we also need to remember to sell the unique benefits of working in our great sector. So whether that's activity providers talking about working in the outdoors and doing what you love, sales and marketing roles promoting that great opportunity to travel overseas, or hotels talking about being able to meet new people every day, free meals and great opportunities for progression. The second key area that the employee talks about in a good job is the working environment. I know a lot of you won't want to hear this, but the research has shown that there are issues on how people are treated in our industry. And while it is frustrating to hear this, the research has shown that the practices are not uncommon. If we are to attract new talent into the sector, then businesses must offer a positive working environment for the employee. 
Specific areas that were called out that need to be addressed are ensuring adequate and regular breaks are in place, treating staff with respect, speaking to them professionally, no shouting, positive feedback, and giving, uh, telling them when they're doing a good job. The other thing they talked about was managers listening to the employee side of the story uh, when customers were complaining and supporting staff when required. So when the team is understaffed or very busy or when customers are refusing to follow direction or becoming abusive. We know for some tourism is not a career. And we saw that in the research. For some, it was all about the flexibility and working hours. So for stu students, it can be a way about uh, financially supporting them through their college years. For retirees, it can be working a few days a week doing something that you love. And for parents, it can be an opportunity to earn money while raising a family. But the research also shows us something very positive, and that's 71% of those working in the sector see it as a long-term career choice. So to attract and retain people, it is important to clearly demonstrate how they can progress. So showing them a clear pathway to success, the skills and experience that they need, and how you, the employer, will support them on this career journey. And help them develop those new skills by providing the required experience. So there are many businesses out there that are already, or, sorry, excuse me, already doing a brilliant job delivering all of this and more. And so let's see some examples of that. The most important thing for us when we look at recruitment is retaining the team that we have here now. Uh, I, I love working here every day. I love working with the people that I work with. And I think the most important thing is that we make uh, the hotel uh, the, the employer that it should be, that people do not want to leave. We know the team are happy here, so the only thing that's pulling them away is, is, is better benefits or better conditions in another business. And why can't the Armada as a hotel provide it as good as any other business that's out there? The challenges that we've faced here with COVID are staffing levels. Um, a lot of people have left the hospitality industry because they don't have job security. And uh, John has supported us here at the Armada Hotel by offering us uh, a secure job to come to every day. There is a, a fantastic wellness program as well for the team and it's something that we picked up on a lot. We do surfing lessons, there's uh, knitting classes during the week as well. So uh, it's a great way then again to meet the team and to get their support. Another one of the key benefits of working here is the room for growth. So not only just myself, I've seen a lot of people come through the door in the short time that I've been here and the hotel really kind of invests in them. So we spend a lot of money on training, we put a lot of time into people, and uh, they really empower us to keep growing uh, with the hotel. Uh, I, I believe the team that are here right now are benefiting from these measures. Look, we're looking after their well-being, we're looking after some of their costs associated with, with, the, with their lifestyle, with healthcare. Um, we're, we're teaching them new skills, we're upskilling them, we're trying to give them skills outside of the workplace. Um, you know, we understand that as an industry, there's the peaks and troughs that are associated with this industry, but we're still trying to make it a great place to work and we're still trying to compensate for that and deal with that in so many different ways. I think retention is the most important thing. I mean, when you recruit, you have to recruit the right person, but then you have to keep them in your business. So how do you do that? The thing about retention is there isn't one size that fits all. It's a detailed thing for every individual. In our kitchens, we instigated a four day week because at some point it wasn't even about the money anymore. It was about a work-life balance. Uh, we're now starting that within our bar roster. We're gonna give it a go and see if the guys want to do it. And they're very much involved in you know, decisions or how is this going to affect your life? You know, is this a good thing or a bad thing for you? Well, we started accentuating the positive. We started talking to people uh, about all of the good things about hospitality and key amongst them is flexibility. And traditionally, there's a view that our industry is long hours, you know, and low pay. And so let, let's take the long hours element off the, the, the table and say to people, you can tailor make your roster. You can work a four day week. And if you want to uh, make requests for time off on a regular basis, that's absolutely fine. Well, the best thing probably about working in Market Lane is the amount of different people from all over the world you get to meet. It doesn't matter if they're customers or staff, I think it is incredible to meet people from all over the place. They, they put in the really, really good work benefits as well. 
Um, if you're on a long, a long day shift or something, you're doing 10, 12 hours or whatnot, you get the, a good size break in the middle, but you can order stuff from the menu. So you can taste the, all the fresh stuff that's actually getting made from the kitchen, so you have a bit more of a connection with the food. So I think what sets us apart as a business is being able to offer people the opportunity to work in five different restaurants, you know, and they can see that there's progression within the restaurant group as well. Uh, a number of our owners started on the floor or in the kitchen, and so now they're part owners in a restaurant business. And so I think that's one of the things that sets us apart. So some great examples there about how you, the industry, are already starting to change and, and meet the needs of the employees. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about Falter Ireland's 2022 plans. And so while businesses are the central drivers of the change, we will be there with you to support you make the changes needed. There are three key action areas where we will support industry in 2022. And fundamentally, they are about getting the people, keeping the people and upskilling the people. And each of these go hand in hand. The three priority areas of focus in our 2022 plans are one, addressing the staff shortages, two, building employee capability and skills to ensure that your team can meet the needs and asks of your customers, and three, to support you to build tourism back bigger and better with an excellent employer program. So, if we look at uh, the biggest challenge that is facing you, and that is staff shortages. In 2022, we will be providing key supports across three activities. That's recruitment best practice, access to local and international talent pools, and best practice for onboarding staff. Firstly, let's look at recruitment. In the months ahead, you will be preparing to fully reopen as the season begins, and competition for staff is likely to become even more, even more fierce. To support you with your recruitment drive and to help you stand out, Falter Ireland will provide you with expert guidance on how to recruit in a competitive market. This will include a webinar with a recruitment expert who will give the latest tips and trends and best practice in recruiting, uh, including designing uh, clear and attractive role profiles, what you need to do to ensure your job ad stands out, and how you can amplify your vacancies to ensure that as many job seekers as possible see them and are attracted to them. We will also provide best practice guidance and practical tunes from a leading expert on how to win, an in, uh, how to win the candidate in an interview. Interview advice is traditionally focused on supporting a potential job candidate to stand out from the crowd. Now the focus is very much on the employer and how they can sell themselves to the potential employee they are interviewing, when the likelihood is that employee is being sought after by other business. The interview process is like a sales pitch and businesses need to pitch to the potential candidate what they offer in order to ensure they can secure their employment. And this can be things like flexible work hours, stable work patterns, uh, evidence of progression, and a commitment to development. All the things you heard in those slides from Market Lane and the Ramada. We will also be supporting businesses to access talent pools that are readily available and can, and can provide a good source of staff these include local talent pools, such as students and people on the live register looking for work, and I'll speak about that in a moment. But we will also support with access to international talent. A key focus for us in 2022, particularly in quarter one of this year, is linking businesses with transition year students who are looking for placements in the spring. These students are at an age where they are beginning to look for seasonal work from next summer and taking them on and giving them a good placement protects, presents a real opportunity for businesses to provide a quality experience, give them some initial training and motivate them to return as a paid staff member in the summer. There are 50,000 transition students out there and during the placement, you as employers also get the chance to see if this potential uh, candidate is right for your business. To make it easy for businesses to link with transition students, we've developed a tool on our tourismcareers.ie website where businesses can post their placements and, and students can easily search for the placements available in their area. 
It is critical that the placements that are offered are of high quality. We want to ensure that the student is motivated to return and sees tourism as a potential career choice. To drive this, we've asked businesses who are taking part to commit to fulfill a number of obligations, such as following a structured template, assigning a mentor, and providing key training and on the skills required. To support this, we have worked with industry bodies, HR experts, education providers, and TY coordinators to develop a student and employer manual. And we will also be carrying out surve uh, surveys with the transition year coordinators and teachers post placement to ensure that the students are getting a, a quality experience and to learn how the process has been going. To find out more your, and how your business can get involved, please do log on to the Fall to Ireland Tourism Careers.ie site. You will see there that there's a webinar which gives you a step-by-step -step guide on how to use the portal and how to hear from businesses who have delivered high quality placements and the benefit it has brought to them and their business in terms of recruiting part-time and seasonal staff. And this initiative will also be uh, supported by a marketing campaign to drive awareness of the placements with students, parents and TY coordinators. So another key source of staffing in peak times are third level students. Falter Ireland has strong links with education providers across the country. And last year, after the reopening, we created a directory of contacts for businesses to access students in their local area. And we hosted a virtual event to bring education and uh, education providers and industry together. In 2022, we will build on this to bring businesses and education providers together again, ensuring that they maximize the opportunity to access students looking for part-time work and seasonal work, but also graduates who are in the market for full-time roles. And throughout the year, our work on tourismcareers.ie will support employers to promote their opportunities to this key talent pool. We regularly reach out to these audience of 16 to 24 year olds with tailor-made content, providing information on the latest jobs available and the career opportunities that go with them. And this is uh, supported by our course finder and live job section for those seeking to take their first steps into the industry. Another source of employees is the live register. And we are working with the Department of Social Protection to maximize the pathways to work strategy for tourism and hospitality businesses. The Department of Social Protection provides a fully mentored training program for people on the live register. And employers can choose to offer employment to participants at any point in the program, and they can get financial incentives for doing this. Fall to Ireland are working with the DSP on the Work Placement Experience Programme and in quarter one we will be launching a bespoke tourism and hospitality training modules including introductions to tourism, modules for newcomers to the industry as well as customer service and a number of core operational skills for hospitality. Businesses who are interested in posting placements right now can find out more on jobsireland.ie or by emailing employer at welfare.ie. So looking beyond our shores and to support you in identifying the international markets with the best potential for pools of talent, Falter Ireland will carry out research to map key source markets in Europe and within these markets to identify labour access points for you. So whether that be URES or similar schemes, colleges or recruitment agencies. And Falter Ireland will also continue to work with industry bodies and government departments on securing securing employment permits for the sector. Every employee who walks through your door needs to be seen as a potential key member of staff who needs to be retained. And with an, with an effective induction process, new employees are far more likely to settle into the job quickly, to get to grips with their role and to hit the ground running. Qualities that are more important now than ever. Fall to Ireland will support you to do this by providing best practice advice on induction and pragmatic tools to use in your induction process. This will cover areas such as how to effectively communicate with your business procedures and setting out clear roles and responsibilities. And we will also provide all new jo joiners to the industry with access to online modules to build their understanding of the sector and to educate them on practical skills such as customer service. 
and we will support your uh, recruitment uh, drive with the campaign. So our national recruitment uh, awareness campaign will relaunch in 2022 to support you in your effort to recruit the best staff. This disruptive multi-channel campaign will promote the energy of working in the industry via national radio, print and vibrant social media, as well as PR. The campaign will tell the story of those employers who are making tourism a rewarding and exciting workplace and those professionals who are thriving in the industry. The call to action will drive job seekers to our tourismcareers.ie site, which continues to provide a one-stop shop for job seekers and students to discover the breadth and variety of courses and careers in our industry, giving advice and tips on the many ways that they can begin their journey. We continue to develop the site with a live job section and the most recently work, uh, added work experience section, all of which are promoting the vast array of opportunity that exists within our great industry. Our content strategy focuses on great employers and passionate professionals featured in motivating vi videos. And this is supported by strategic social media and digital marketing campaigns to drive traffic to certain areas of the site. And we will continue to work with education providers to develop content on the site to drive awareness and consideration of third level courses. And this includes a new course finder tool as well as campaigns targeting CAO CAO students. We always welcome fresh content, so please get in touch with the team if you have any motivating content that showcases the exciting career opportunities in our industry. So now to the second priority area of our plans, and this is about uh, employee capability. Our research showed that in 2021, one in three people in the industry were new, leading to key skills and capability gaps across the industry, which had a significant impact on business performance as well as customer service. Fall to Ireland in 2022 will support your businesses to address these key skills and capability gaps in a number of ways. At a business level, our enterprise development team will work with you to drive business performance and build capability in some of the areas with gaps as highlighted by you in the survey of a thousand employers. And these areas include finance and commercial performance, sales and marketing, revenue management, and operational excellence. And to support that, we will have online learning, which will be made available to businesses for their employees to upskill them in key skills areas, which they can access at their own pace. And this will include the introduction to tourism module I referred to already, the customer service, but also core operational skills and workplace knowledge and behaviors for a successful career. And this will help support the onboarding of new employees. We are creating a framework of blended learning for businesses to directly train their staff in line with business needs. This approach will drive operational efficiencies and help foster a culture of ongoing skills development in the workplace. The framework has four key strands. One is operational trainers in tourism, developing operational teams capability to deliver training, upskilling for their own staff directly in line with the skills gap in their own business. Providing the staff with a framework for success to apply the learnings from this training. And this can be things like the application of SOPs or um, efficiency, uh, operational efficiencies and customer service. Online learning will also be provided to enable this upskilling, including a range of how-to videos and specific modules. And there will also be on-site support from the Fall to Ireland team to review the implementation and application of the skills development framework and to help optimize the current needs of that individual business. And so to the third and final focus area of our 2022 plans, and that's the Excellent Employer Programme. One of the most common themes that came out of our research was that employees feel that a lot more needs to be done to make working in the industry appealing and rewarding. Fall to Ireland is launching a major new initiative, the Excellent Employer Programme, and this is to support tourism businesses to demonstrate their commitment to being rewarding and appealing workplaces so that they can compete for and retain skilled employees. Many of you are already doing this. This programme gives you a platform to showcase 
your great businesses and for us to showcase the many excellent employers in our sector. The programme aims to support businesses to demonstrate their employee focus and to drive positive changes in the workplace. Through the programme, Fall to Ireland will work with everyone uh, from businesses who are just starting fresh in developing their people practices to helping them take action in key areas that will drive employee engagement and satisfaction to businesses who are leading the way in these practices. This pro programme will also focus on showcasing and celebrating the businesses. The goal is that the workplace culture across the industry is something that employers view as being as important as the service they provide to their customers. Fundamentally, it will be the voice and views of the employee that will change and drive the repositioning of the industry as an appealing and rewarding place to work. So, to be eligible from, for, for this programme, and to ensure the focus is on driving long-term change, we're asking businesses to commit to participating in the programme for a minimum of three years, ensuring that anyone who manages people in your business will be provided with the right skills to do it in an effective way through people management training, which will be provided by Fault Ireland, participating in an independent annual survey of the employees, this survey will be central in both capturing and actioning the employees' views. To support you to do this, Fall to Ireland will provide a range of people management and employee engagement supports. We will contribute to the cost of the annual survey. As of today, we're seeking a supplier with expertise in employee engagement to do this for the industry so that it is independent and has credibility both with the employer and the employee, and also that it will provide us with cross-sectoral benchmarking. It will also provide targeted solutions and supports to enable businesses to action the development areas highlighted in the survey. For businesses with less than 10 employees, a survey isn't effective because there's too much volatility in the results as one or two observations can stew it can skew it, but we will develop a program for small businesses who want to participate. So why participate in this program? The employee survey will identify for you the areas that are working well and the areas that need development to make your organisation a better place to work. Fall to Ireland will provide supports to help you action these development areas and to make a real positive change. There will be an opportunity to be certified and recognised as a top employer in the sector so that businesses, so your business will be seen as an appealing place to work. Engagement with employees and demonstrating that you are listening and actioning their feedback will improve retention of existing workforce, but it will also make you more competitive in securing an empl uh, new employees. And the programme will provide a framework to change the narrative and have the industry work together to reposition how this great sector is seen. So, how can you get involved? We've talked about a lot of things today. Um, I suppose just immediately what you can do is actually log on to faultoireland.ie to the tourism career section and follow the links. You can upload um, a, your transition your work placement and access the webinar that will show you how to do that. You can sign up for the following. So we've got the recruitment in a competitive market we webinar on the 28th of February. We've got the webinar on interviewing to win on the 8th of March. And we've got from newcomer to team member effective onboarding on the 15th of March. And please do send us motivating content that showcases the best of careers in our industry, and we will feature that on tourismcareers.ie. And I would ask that all of you do sign up to the Excellent Employer Programme. We will be launching this in the coming months, and we will email you when the programme is opened and explain how you can register. So I'd like to finish up by saying that the engagement we've had with you and your sectoral bodies and the extensive research we have complete, uh, completed has shaped our plans. So I want to thank you for your engagement with us and in the research. As always, we're committed to working with you all, individual business, 
sexual bodies and the careers oversight group and the wider industry and we look forward to working together to build this great sector back bigger and better so that's all for now in terms of the presentations please bear with us for a couple of minutes because we're going to set up the panel on stage and we're going to say take your questions and answers so paul and cayman could i ask you to come on to the stage Great, Jenny, thank you so much. Um, so a really comprehensive package of measures outlined there today, and the questions are flowing in from our audience, which is great. Um, so I'm now just going to give a few minutes for Paul and Cayman and Jenny to take their seats. I suppose as our speakers have highlighted, and as everyone here will be very aware, the staffing challenges the industry is facing at the moment is one of the main barriers to businesses being able to fully reopen and recover. So it's no surprise that there are lots of common themes emerging from the floor, ranging from questions on the research through to detail of the recruitment supports and what they will mean for businesses. We will endeavor to get through as many of these as possible. And for those we don't get around to this afternoon, we'll answer in an FAQ document following the event. So I'm just going to Go to the iPad and we'll have some live questions in from the floor, which is great. Um, a lot of interest came in, in the research. So I suppose it's certainly one of the most wide ranging and in-depth research pieces that we've done. Um, there's an awful lot to digest there. So I suppose you spoke about acute staffing and skills shortage and being, I suppose, that it isn't unique to Ireland. So a question and a number have come in uh, from the floor is you know what's happening in other countries around staffing etc and then really how does ireland compare to other countries and i suppose most importantly what can we learn from them we'll start with the, the last one there thanks for the set of questions um i was hoping we could learn a lot actually and short circuit the homework but we're pretty much all in the same position and in fact ireland is probably slightly ahead of the competition in, in resolving this one so we looked at what was going on in Canada, New Zealand, Scotland, Denmark, and a couple of other places, not Denmark, um, the Netherlands, and a couple of other countries. But what we did see was, because the reopening in Ireland was a little bit delayed, we, we were slightly behind them, but our economic recovery is way ahead of those of other countries. And the extent of the change in the flux in our labor market is much more than it is in, in other countries. So that means they're probably looking at us learning from our work program rather than the other way around this time. So we are certainly taking a more comprehensive approach to dealing with the issue and we are definitely taking a more partnership approach with the industry to, to resolve it. I did mention there were some countries out there and they were looking at public sector bodies to resolve the issue. So for example, um, opening up the, or resolving or sort of rearranging their permit system, but that's very unlikely to work if the fundamental attractiveness of the industry isn't resolved because everyone is trying that trick and there's a lot more to be done than just that. Thank you. Perfect, thank you, Cayman. Another common theme is about the level of negative publicity that surrounds working in the industry. And I suppose we know that that negative perception working in the industry was there prior to the pandemic. So I suppose a question is, you know, Jenny, how can we kind of talk to these negative perceptions and what can we do? So I suppose it's important to look at the research we did. So as Cayman said, it's, it was one of the most robust pieces of research we've done. There was a lot of real positive stuff inside there. So if you think about it, 71% of those that are working in the industry see it as a long-term career choice. So that's a very positive thing. Um, if you look at those that have left the industry, 90% of those are saying that they will reconsider coming back in. And I think it is interesting, although there's a lot of conversation about pay, the things that they're talking about, there's a lot of things that we can do before we start to address pay, like the, you know, 50% were saying that stable shift patterns are really key and fundamental to them. And I know for industry that can be challenging, but we have seen a lot of businesses already starting to do that. The other thing that there was there, over 30% talked about having clarity on that career progression. And I think that's one that as an industry, we need to talk about more. Because if you compare us, we, we've been in a very competitive market with retail. We know a lot of you have given us feedback that you've lost staff to the retail sector. If you think about the 
actually rate of progression in retail versus tourism, it's a lot slower, but we don't shout and promote that. So it's one of the things that we need to really talk about in a much clearer way so that those who don't work in the industry can understand those progression opportunities and they can see how readily they are available. So I think you know we've got to start to talk about those positive things. And yes, we do also have to address the things that will motivate those back into the industry. Perfect, thank you, Jenny. Paul, uh, one of the themes that seems to be everywhere at the moment and coming up again with our audience here today is the impact of rising costs and how this just might impact on recruitment and how do you think this can be addressed? Yeah, God, thanks for the easy one, Martina. Um, uh, look, I mean, um, inflation is not just a tourism issue. It is an economy-wide issue. Uh, it's not just an Ireland issue. It's a global issue. Um, and it obviously you know, in terms of, it, it, it's a double whammy for businesses because the overhead inflation, leaving aside the, 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 the cost of people and labor, the overhead inflation, uh, you know, be it insurance, energy, pass-through costs, um, uh, food and beverage costs, et cetera, you know, is putting real pressure on, on businesses. And then, but that's also the sort of stuff is putting pressure on household incomes, which is driving uh, labor, labor cost inflation as well. So. Um, I mean, the, the, the important thing, I suppose, is that we, you know, we, we, re, we retain competitiveness. Uh, and, you know, I think so, uh, the, you know, what it says, you know, we, we've got to, um, and it would be very understandable for the tourism industry to kind of go, you know what, not only have we got to deal with all these costs, but we've got to get back some of the money we lost during COVID. And we got to kind of try and get all that back as quickly as we can, but with, through, through increased pricing. And, you know, I think the, the, the watch out is that we've got to be really careful about that because that will drive us to be uncompetitive. It will make people kind of come but not come back again. Um, so, you know, I think that's the, 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 the um, uh, you know, it's just we, we've just got to, you know, manage that as, as well as possible, try and keep those costs uh, under control as well as possible. We'll, we'll provide as much kind of training and, and support and information as, uh, as, as, as we can. But, but and equally then, uh, Cayman and the team are doing a big study uh, over the next couple of months. We'll have, the, we'll have the results before summer in it. That's benchmarking the input cost uh, in Irish tourism industry versus the input costs in other destinations. Because we've got to, you know, internationally, we've got to remain competitive. An Irish industry can only re remain competitive if its input costs aren't increasing faster than in other markets. So, you know, that report will, when we have that in the next few months, will really help us kind of understand what are the key areas that need to be focused on and make sure that we've got that real understanding of, of how we can stay competitive long term. Perfect. And it won't be solved overnight. Obviously, no. it's going to be a, a longer term game. Um, we've seen a lot of discussion in recent days as well and questions coming through here today about the industry looking to recruit for roles that are overseas. Um, so Jenny, you touched on that in the presentation about supporting industry to target international talent pools. So maybe can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So look, I mean, the first protocol obviously we talked about was that we'd be looking at what we can do from domestically, but we do know that there are a lot of senior roles that we need skills and experience for, and we do need to look overseas for that. And the question is, where do we look overseas? Because as Cayman said, everybody and all the other countries are also looking and we know that we're talking to other um, tourist boards in, in whether it's northern ireland in the uk in spain and they're all fe uh, facing the same challenge so it's really important for us to understand in what markets will Ireland be competitive? Because we know, for example, that we're not, uh, we're an expensive country to live in. So again, how can we compete with other destinations? So we are commissioning a piece of research where we will be mapping uh, the European countries uh, to understand where Ireland can be competitive as a, a source of employment. But we're also going to be looking at, you know, where what other European countries have links to other areas so that, that you can get the, um, European, uh, so that you can work with the, uh, the European Union, within the European Union. Uh, so there's a piece of research that's going to be done on that. And once we identify those markets, we're also then going to work about how do you access those uh, talent pools. So, you know, there is the, the URES program, so will that work? But also what we've done in, in some countries is we've um, developed relationships with universities uh, so that we could, you know, get uh, employers to go in and actually do an Ireland day where they can, um, 
pitch the jobs and the opportunities that are avail available in Ireland. And we're also going to be ac uh, looking at recruitment agencies to see how we can get access to that talent pool that are there. Okay, thank you, Jenny. Um, Paul, another easy question. Um, there's just been quite a lot of talk amongst industry about CERT and bringing something like that back. So I suppose, what's our view on that? There's lots of really wonderful initiatives that are happening, lots of supports that are out there, but what's your view on that call? Yeah, look, I mean, um, uh, you know, a number of years ago, the, you know, the, the, the government at the time made the decision that the education sit, should, should sit within the education expertise and education space. And the remit of, of Fulge Ireland as it was formed was around the development of the tourism sector. And I think that is absolutely the right division that was done back long before my time. I think it was absolutely the right decision, you know, in terms of so there is no shortage of courses out there for people to in terms of any area of, of tourism, from general tourism management to culinary arts, etc. You know, all of those courses are available. There's a plethora of them. You know, I mean, we don't need another organization bringing in any more courses. So there's, it, it's about working with all of those courses. I mean, the, one of the real challenges, uh, and this was happening be before COVID, was that the numbers of people who were going into those courses was going down and down and down every year. Um, and, and that was despite at the time that Fulch Ireland was giving kind of extra grant support, which in, in a lot of ways was duplicating what was already going on with the likes of Susie grants and stuff like that. So it wasn't an efficient, an efficient or an effective use of, of, of our money. The kind of programs that Jenny uh, has just outlined is a far more effective use of our money uh, on behalf of the tourism industry. So, uh, you know, I don't think there's, you know, in terms of the, there isn't any benefit in going back to that kind of for that kind of uh, um, solution at all. The solutions are there from an education point of view. It's about making making the industry one people want to work in, and about you know the type and promoting that uh, uh, as much as we possibly can, which is exactly what we're, what we're trying to do. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Paul. Um, a lot of interest in the excellent employer program, and I suppose a question around the length, Jenny. So, is three years not too long a commitment? For the excellent employer program considering how volatile the industry is at present and maybe can you explain the rationale for that length of initial commitment yeah so i suppose the the reason behind that is year one is kind of when you join and you get the first report and that actually uh, gives you areas that you need to develop and change then you've actually got to work on those so you implement action plans and then in the second year you'll actually see how much progress you made but, you know, we in Falter Ireland have actually um, entered into a, a, a scheme a bit like this, the Great Places to Work. And actually what you'll see as a business from that, you need actually to have at least two years working at it to actually improve your performance and actually to really start to see the benefits in your business. So while three years seems a long time, actually the first year is where you're going to get your report. And that only gives you two years to really action it. And we are looking for change. It's about action in the businesses and making a difference. And the reality is it will take the two years, you know, after that first year to actually do that. So I think the important thing is once businesses get into it, it's not going to be massively onerous. I think it is about the things that you're already doing. It just provides a framework for it and there'll be huge support there. So I think it will, you know, we do believe that it is that three years will be required. And we've spoken to a lot of people out there about these kinds of schemes and that's the advice that we've been given. Okay, perfect. That's really all of the questions at the moment, um, right across those teams. So I just want to thank the panelists, Paul and Jenny and Cayman for all of your input. And thanks also to the audience members uh, for giving us your time today and for posting your questions throughout. It's been great to see everyone here at the live event once again. And I know that many of you have traveled and you know, are now making your way back uh, to other parts of Ireland. So I suppose you'll be keen to get back on the road again and for those questions that we didn't get to cover today or that you're thinking about and perusing and might send in later, uh, we will be sending out an FAQ document that will answer all of those. So I'd just like to hand back to Paul Kelly, our CEO, who will now close the session. Thank you. Great.
Thank you, Martina, and thanks everyone for your questions. Uh, look, just before I close today, the final thing I'd just like to do is I'd like to thank everyone involved in organising today. As you can imagine, today's like, days like this don't get put together um, uh, by, by, by a small team. There's, there's a large team behind it, and a lot of work goes into pulling these events today. I'd like to particularly thank uh, Stephen Meehan and all of the staff here to CCD for their exceptional work in producing uh, the event with us today. I'd like to say a big thank you to Rachel and the great team in Verve who really helped us deliver this today. I'd also like to thank uh, Creative Technology who managed all of our AV and the creative agencies 256 and Custodian, all who helped us put, put this together today. Also from our own team in Fulge, a big thanks to Fiona Knox, Leisha Donnelly and all of the team uh, that worked on this. But finally, and most importantly, I want to thank all of you. I know how much time pressure you're all under in your own businesses, so we really do appreciate you taking that time out to join us today and to stay with us uh, right, right throughout it. Um, and, look, fi and finally, I want to wish all of you the very best for the year ahead. And please know that however it goes, the team in Fault Ireland will be here to support you as much as we possibly can. Uh, Gurmila Mahagat, Augustana Walia.